going to continue with Dr. Norman Silverman's series in May, and we are going to talk about uh, double outlet uh, uh, ventricles. Probably we are going to have two sessions on the on that. So uh, I, now with you, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Diane, and after uh, we are going to have uh, a very good discussion. Please type all of your questions on the Q and A chat box, so we are going to be able to answer and to debate in the end of the session. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see from the title of the image on the screen at, at the moment, the topic for today's discussion is congenitally corrected transposition. And as you see, I've posed some questions. What do we mean by congenitally corrected transposition? And is this the most appropriate title with which to describe the lesion? We can get into this if we look at the history of congenitally corrected transposition. When it was first described, it was recognized as being associated with abnormal cardiac septation. This is the book in which, as far as I'm aware, we find the first illustration of a heart we know to be congenitally corrected transposition. As you see, it's published in German. It comes, in fact, from Vienna, and the author of the journal, this man, the Baron von Rokitansky. Here is his picture. He's rather a distinguished looking gentleman. In fact, he was a Bohemian and he received his medical degree at the Charles University in Prague, but he moved to Vienna, which was recognized as a center of excellence in those days, not to say that Prague was not, but Rokitansky moved to Vienna became the professor of pathology at the University of Vienna and indeed became the foremost pathologist of the 19th century. And this is his baronial coat of arms. This was awarded to him in 1874, which was a year before the book that I've just shown you. And you see, it's rather a splendid coat of arms. It's replete with eagles and rampant lions. So the Baron von Rakistansky was quite a character. And this is the wonderful picture from his book that illustrates to us the features of congenitally corrected transposition. He did not know it at the time, but he was showing the image perfectly for modern day echocardiographers. So we're looking at the short axis of ventricular mass, we can recognize that the atrial chamber on the right side is the morphologically right atrium. And what we can also recognize is that the valve that is joining this atrial chamber to the right sided ventricular chamber is a morphologically mitral valve. And from that, we can deduce that the right sided ventricular chamber was the morphologically left ventricle. You note that the valve has no separate attachments. You also see that the arterial root that is emerging from this right-sided ventricle is deeply wedged between the leaflet of the atrioventricular valve and the abnormal ventricular septum. And that valve is supporting the pulmonary trunk. So when we look at the left side of the heart, we can recognize that there is a normal morphologically left atrium, but it is passing through a valve that we can see to be morphologically tricuspid. Note, it has septal attachments. And then here is the key point. Arising from this left-sided morphologically right ventricle, we have the aortic root, and that gives rise to the anterior and left-sided aorta. So unequivocally, a very nice picture of what we now recognize as being and genetically corrected transposition. But it has not always been described in that fashion. For quite some time, people would call congenitally corrected transposition as representing ventricular inversion. We're going to come back to this as we move into today's discussion. And then in the middle part of the 20th century, Maurice Lev 
an outstanding cardiac pathologist, suggested we should consider congenitally corrected transposition as being mixed levocardia. I think very few of us these days know what Lev meant by this term, and I don't think we should worry too much about that because it's not very helpful. Nowadays, however, I recognize that very many of you will be considering this entity as L transposition, and we're going to show you why that is less than perfect. And we now know, in fact, that the lesion, the essence of the lesion, is the combination of discordant connections across both the atrioventricular and the ventricular arterial junctions. And it's the combination of the two discordant connections that cancel each other out and congenitally correct the circulatory patterns. And in essence, what we're talking about is the triumph of what I now like to think of as sequential segmental analysis. Now, you all know that over our recent discussions, we've been debating the merits of sequential segmental analysis, and our faculty members have commented that the material we present before you is not always easy to grasp at the first sight. So what we're going to do today before we get into the details of congenitally corrected transposition, is we're going to present to you the evolution of sequential segmental analysis. So what do we mean by sequential segmental analysis? And what does it provide for us? Well, to my mind, the system we now use permits us logically to describe all the variations that we come across when the heart is congenitally malformed, even if we've never seen those variations before. So why should there still be debate and arguments as to how we use this system of analysis? Well, as I say, if we look back and we study the evolution of this approach to nomenclature, we will find that until quite late in the 20th century, people tended to put genital cardiac lesions into pigeonholes. And indeed, there is still a tendency for many of us to do that. But in the middle of the 20th century, there was usually a category for those that did not fit the specific pigeonholes, and they were considered to be miscellaneous. And they were the ones that had the most complex circulatory patterns. And all of this was changed by the introduction at that time of what was the segmental approach. And you are all well aware that these are the two people who introduced the segmental approach to diagnosis. You will recognize my good friend Richard Van Praag. Here he is with his wife, Stella, sadly. Stella died quite some time ago now, but Richard is still active, and by my understanding, he still attends and functions in his own archive, which is held at Boston Children's Hospital. And there can be no question but that the appearance of these manuscripts, you see one appearing in 1964 when he was discussing the value of congenital dextrocardia. There was another one about what we now call the functionally univentricular heart that appeared in 1964. But then Richard summarized this approach in this key review, which appeared in 1972. And he called it segmental approach to diagnosis in congenital heart disease. And there can be no question but that, in terms of the philosophic approach promoted by Thomas Kuhn, this was a paradigm shift. It totally changed the way we began to analyze congenital cardiac disease. So what Richard and his colleagues did was to point out that we could take the heart and we could take it apart in terms of its segments. And those segments are the atrial chambers, the ventricular mass, and the arterial trunks. And what Richard had appreciated was that having taken apart the heart into these three segments, there was very limited variability 
in which the components of these individual segments could be related one to the other. Over and above that, there was equal limitation in the way that these components could join together, or not join together, across the junctions between them. So Richard was emphasizing the importance of the cardiac segments. And we do much the same thing. So why have problems have arisen and why is there still this apparent schism between the way we look at things using sequential segmental analysis and the original segmental approach, which is still used in very many centers. And it all comes down, I believe, to this one problem. Because when we tried, when we were developing our own approach in the middle of the 1970s, having read Richard's paper in 1972, we were trying, we thought, simply to modify it, to make it easier for understand, to understand for us, and hopefully for those who were using the system in the United Kingdom and in Europe. And we failed, unfortunately, to recognize that when Dr. Van Praag was using the words concordance and discordance, he was talking about the harmony or the disharmony between the arrangements of those segments. We had presumed that when Richard was using atrioventricular concordance, he meant that the right atrium was joined to the right ventricle and the left atrium was joined to the left ventricle. And when he was using discordance, which is particularly pertinent to, to today's discussion, he was talking about the right atrium joined to the left ventricle and the left atrium joined to right ventricle. And indeed, there are many who still use atrioventricular concordance and atrioventricular discordance on the understanding that that's what Richard meant when he first introduced these terms. In fact, that is not the case. There was, however, another problem that has continued to be a problem, and that is the way we distinguish between the components of the various cardiac chambers. And if you're going to use sequential segmental analysis, the first thing you have to do is to distinguish what is right and what is left. So there are still problems as to how we distinguish between the atrial chambers. And we're going to look at that, how we distinguish between the chambers, and then we'll come back to the problems that existed in terms of the use of concordance, discordance. So it is still the case when Dr. Van Praag is analyzing the and distinguishing between the atrial chambers, he emphasizes the significance of the veno-atrial connections. But does it always work when you use veno-atrial connections to try to determine which atrial chamber is morphologically right and which atrial chamber is morphological left. Now, as in the previous weeks, I am joined today by Diane Spicer, and Diane now is going to supplement my narration to you by showing you the thing with video demonstrations. So Diane is now going to show you one of the potential problems that exist when we use, or when we try to use rather, venoatrial chambers to distinguish between the morphologically right and the morphologically left atrium. So now over to Diane for her first demonstration. We all associate the superior and inferior cable veins at, with the morphologically right atrium and the pulmonary veins with the morphologically left atrium. But it's important to remember that these structures are variable. When I was initially trained to do autopsies, I was taught to lift the heart upwards and to the right. And if the left lung didn't move, we were to suspect anomalous pulmonary venous return. And you can see I have that situation in this case where there's no attachment between the pulmonary veins and the morphologically left atrium. The pulmonary veins drain in a confluence posterior to the heart in a vertical vein that extends between the right and left pulmonary arteries. This vertical vein then ascends 
between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk to drain into the left brachiocephalic vein and then the superior cable vein and back into the right atrium so that if we were to use the pulmonary veins as our morphologic determinant we would now have to call the right atrium the left atrium because that's where the pulmonary veins ultimately drain. In fact, Dr. Van Prague had realized that you cannot always use the venoatrial connection. So as you know, there is a little atlas that is now being produced by David Ezon and his colleagues from Texas Children's Hospital in which they compare and contrast the approaches taken by ourselves and taken by Dr. Van Prague. And Dr. Van Prague recognizes you cannot use venoatrial connections in the setting of totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection. But he had also, quite some time ago, produced a principle that should have told us that this was not the case. And that is the principle that he labeled the morphological method. And the morphological method is not only of value in determining the use of the venoatrial connections, it's of value in most instances of when we are trying to describe components of the cardiac chambers. Because what Dr. Van Prague suggested was that we should not use one feature that is itself variable to define another variable feature. Instead, he said that when we are trying to distinguish between the components, we should do that on the basis of the part of the chamber that is itself most constant. This is the letter in which he and his colleagues emphasize the significance of the so-called morphological method. He was criticizing a paper that my colleagues and I had written at the time in 1979 when we were trying to disqualify the morphologically left ventricle in the setting of double inlet right ventricle from ventricular status. And he was 100% correct. And we realized immediately this principle, the morphological method, not only works in the setting of the ventricular chambers, it works whenever you are looking for the most, the most appropriate way to distinguish between the cardiac segments. And so we need to ask if we are going to distinguish between the atrial chambers using the morphological method, what are the components we're going to find within the atrial chambers and which of them is most constant? So now Diane is going to show you in a normal heart, what are the components of the morphologically right and the morphologically left atrial chambers? We're going to take a look at the components of the right and left atriums, namely the venous component, the appendage, the vestibule, and the body, and we'll see that the septum is that structure that separates right from left. The venous component on the right is the superior and inferior cable veins. The right atrial appendage has a broad junction with the venous component, and you can see that it also has a characteristic triangular or blunt tip. Many people think that this triangular tip is all that makes up the right appendage when in actuality it is this entire anterior aspect. This atrium has been opened along what would have been the terminal groove and that marks this broad venous junction. The superior and inferior cable veins join the roof and the floor of the right atrium and you can see that that venous junction is relatively smooth. The appendage is marked by its pectinate muscles that extend around its anterior aspect and around the right atrioventricular junction. I failed to mention that another venous component we see within the right atrium is the coronary sinus. The pectinate muscles are the morphologic determinant for the right atrium because they are the most consistent feature. You'll note that the venous component can be variable as can the septal structures. The right atrial vestibule is made up of this very smooth, thin 
circumferential region that is delineated by the hinge point of the tricuspid valve and the distal extent of the pectinate muscles. So this smooth, uh, if you will, stripe that surrounds the right atrioventricular junction. The septal components are made up of the primary portion, which is the floor or the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa and the anterior inferior muscular buttress. The left atrium is typically associated with the pulmonary veins draining into that chamber and I will note that those pulmonary veins are variable structures so we cannot use them as a morphologic determinant. The left atrial appendage is typically tubular often with scallops or crenellations along its edge. The appendage has a very narrow attachment to the body of the atrium and you'll note that there is no evidence of a terminal groove. Within the atrium, there is also no evidence of a terminal crest and the atrial vestibule is smooth. The pectinate muscles are confined to the appendage within the morphologically left atrium. The body of the left atrium is in this area and we can see the back or the left side of the flap valve which makes up the septal component. This flap valve typically has this horseshoe appearance where the left side becomes adherent to the superior interatrial fold. We've already discussed the variable structures that are associated with the atriums, namely the venous components and the septal structures. So I'm showing you this short axis view of both atriums from the base of the heart to demonstrate that the pectinate muscles on the right extend around the right atrioventricular junction and are their most constant component. The pectinate muscles on the left are confined to the atrial appendage. That appendage with a very narrow attachment to the atrial vestibule and a very smooth vestibule all the way around. Remember that the venous component or the attachment of the appendage to the venous component on the right was broad. So the pectinate muscles are our morphologic determinant for the atriums. The right atrium, the pectinated appendage, and the left atrium with the tubular appendage and narrow attachment and a smooth vestibule. So Diane now has shown you the most constant part of the atrial chambers is the appendage. More importantly than that, she's also shown you that the most significant component of the appendages themselves is pectinate muscles. What you have seen in the video demonstrations to date is that when we take the atrial chambers, we look at the appendages, we look at the extent of the pectinate muscles relative to the vestibules, we can distinguish what is morphologically right and what is morphologically left. And you can now work out that since there are only two atrial chambers, there are only two atrial appendages. Those appendages can either be morphologically right or morphologically left. There are only four possible arrangements. So the starting point of sequential segmental analysis is to determine atrial arrangement, and we should be doing that on the basis of the atrial appendages. So what are those possibilities? Well, almost always, when you are looking at patients who have congenitally malformed hearts, the atrial appendage in which the pectinate muscles come to the crooks is on the right side. The atrial appendage, which is tubular, which, has a, which is associated with an atrium itself having a smooth vestibule, is on the left side. And that is what we like to call usual atrial arrangement. In a small minority of cases, the entire thing is mirror-imaged. Many of you may think of that as inversus, 
we're going to discuss the use of mirror imagery as opposed to inversion in just a moment. But let's first look at the other possibilities. Because you know that there are other ways in which the atrial chambers can be arranged. And there are two subsets in these arrangements. And we find those when the atrial appendages themselves are mirror images of each other in the same individual. And so these are the arrangements that represent isomerism. And when we have a situation in which both appendages are morphologically right, pectinate muscles come to the crooks on both sides, this obviously is the right isomerism of the atrial appendages. Whereas if we have smooth vestibules with the pectinate muscles confined within the tubular appendages on both sides, that is left isomerism of the atrial appendages. And this is the starting point, sequential segmental analysis. And as we will see, this is the key to the description and definition of congenitally corrected transposition. But before we move on and go any further, let's look at the way we describe what is in front of our eyes. How do we use words? Now, I hope you will all agree that an integral part nowadays of diagnosis is the multidisciplinary team meeting. And that means we have to communicate with each other using words we all understand. And it's my belief that that means we should use the words as everybody understands them. We should avoid jargon. So in that setting, let's take an example of how we might use mirror imagery as opposed to inversion. And Diane has a very nice example to show you to illustrate the difference between mirror imagery and inversion and to show how that is equally valuable in the setting of the congenitally malformed heart. I'm using this coffee cup to show us that when we talk about inversus or situs inversus in the setting of congenital heart disease, we are actually talking about mirror imagery. And I can achieve that by using this coffee cup. And actually, if the handle is the appendage of the cup, I can rotate it 180 degrees, and we have the mirror image of that cup. But if I invert the cup and turn it upside down, and there was coffee within that cup, I would now have spilled all of the coffee on the table. So now we've looked at the atrial chambers. We've determined how can we can distinguish between what is morphologically right and what is morphologically left by looking at their most constant part. So if we are continue sequential segmental analysis, we now need to do the same thing with ventricles. And if we are to do that, first thing we have to establish is that the ventricular mass itself is the component of myocardium that extends from the atrioventricular to the ventricular arterial junctions. And almost without exception, the ventricular mass as thus defined contains two chambers. We've discussed at length recently as to whether these chambers should be considered ventricles. And I think now we agree that they do, recognizing that they are not always normal ventricles. But so as to put this into the context of congenitally corrected transposition, we need to revisit how best we should describe them and how we should recognize them as being morphologically right or left. Here we're looking at an opened, morphologically right ventricle in attitudinally appropriate position, so that this would be the diaphragmatic surface. All ventricles, or I should say both right and left ventricles, have an inlet, an outlet, and an apical trabecular component. And the ventricles extend from the atrioventricular junction to the ventriculoarterial junction. The morphologically right ventricle has a tricuspid valve within its inlet portion, the tricuspid valve with septal and papillary muscle attachments. The inlet component is marked from the hinge point of that tricuspid valve 
to where the tendinous cords attach to either the septum or the papillary muscle. So the inlet component is here. The apical trabecular component on the right is its morphologic determinant as it is not variable in any fashion. The trabecular component on the right is very coarse and the septal surface is often coarsely trabeculated as well. As we know, we have that prominent trabeculation, the septomarginal trabeculation, and here we can see the moderator band which would have connected to the anterior papillary muscle and crosses the space within the right ventricle between the septal and free walls. The right ventricle has a complete muscular sleeve supporting the pulmonary valve which is within its outlet component. This muscular sleeve also separates the atrioventricular from the arterial valve within the right ventricle. And I will note that the infundibular structure is also a variable component. Within the left ventricle, we have the atrioventricular valve Again, within its inlet component, the left ventricle also has an apical trabecular component and an outlet component, so that this ventricle also extends from the atrioventricular junction to the ventriculoarterial junction. Within the left ventricular inlet, as I said, we have the mitral valve. It's supported by paired papillary muscles. And the inlet within the left ventricle is marked by the hinge point of this mitral valve to where it attaches to the papillary muscles. You'll also note that there are no attachments of those, papillary, or those tendinous cords, I should say, to the septal surface. The apical trabecular component within the left ventricle is its morphologic determinant, and the trabeculations are fine and crisscrossing. The septal surface typically becomes smooth as we approach the outlet in which the aorta lies within the left ventricle. So we have the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve in fibrous continuity with the aortic valve on the left so that unlike the right ventricle, there is no complete muscular infundibulum. If I place a morphologically right ventricle in a normal heart next to a morphologically left ventricle in a heart with congenitally corrected transposition, you can clearly see how the morphologic determinant is constant between the right and left ventricles. Here we have a coarsely trabeculated morphologically right ventricle in a normal heart and on the right side of the heart a ventricle with fine crisscrossing apical trabeculations in a heart with congenitally corrected transposition. You'll also appreciate the smooth septal surface towards the outlet so that the apical trabecular component is the most common component as we can have multiple variations at the inlet and at the outlet of the ventricle. So Diane has shown you that it is the apical parts that are the most constant and they should be the final arbiters in distinguishing what is morphologically right as opposed to what is morphologically left. But we are not denying the value also of valvar morphology. So, of course, you should take note of the morphology of the valves when they are present. So, in normally constituted ventricles that have an inlet and an outlet, we know that the atrioventricular valves go with their appropriate ventricles. And we know that almost always the valve of the outlet of the right ventricle has an infundibulum, whereas the valve of the left ventricle is usually in fibrous continuity with the atrioventricular valve. So we use that information to distinguish between the ventricles when it is present. But when we're talking about congenitally corrected transposition, 
it's also key to know how the ventricles are related to each other. So we know that when each ventricle is normally constituted, the right ventricle wraps itself around the left ventricle. And this wrapping of the right ventricle around the left ventricle permits us to distinguish two features that again are mirror images of each other. And that means we can usefully distinguish them by comparing them to the hands that we all have, the palmar surfaces of the hands. Dr. Van Prague distinguished between these variants in terms of rightward as opposed to leftward looping. We prefer to think of it in terms of handedness. And now Diane is going to show you the concept of ventricular topology as determined by using the palmar surfaces of our hands. The normally formed right ventricle wraps itself around the left ventricle, permitting two basic arrangements with reference to topology. So here we see an opened morphologically right ventricle with its coarse apical trabecular component. And I can place only the palm of my right hand on the septal surface with my thumb in the inlet and my fingers in the outlet. This demonstrates right hand ventricular topology. The second basic arrangement that we see is in the morphologically right ventricle on the left side of the heart in those hearts with congenitally corrected transposition. So that in the inlet we have our tricuspid valve, we have our coarse apical trabecular component and the aorta within the outlet components supported by a complete muscular infundibulum. And if I place the palm of my left hand on the septal surface with my thumb in the inlet and my fingers in the outlet, this exhibits left hand ventricular topology. Now the beauty of using the palmar surfaces of our hands and relating this to ventricular topology is that you do not change this arrangement by tilting the ventricular mass or by rotating the ventricular mass. Because the whole point of topology, you cannot change topology simply by rotation or tilting. In order to change a topological interrelationship, you have to cut a apart the components and put them back together in different fashion. So Diane is now going to demonstrate to you how in setting of congenitally corrected transposition, you do not change topology simply by rotating the ventricular mass. If we look at this heart with congenitally corrected transposition, initially the apex was to the left and there was usual atrial arrangement. But if I twist or rotate the ventricular mass so that we now have our morphologically left atrium connected to our morphologically right ventricle, on the right, when I open that morphologically right ventricle, it will still only admit the palm of my left hand on the septal surface with my thumb in the inlet and my fingers in the outlet. So that left hand ventricular topology is still existing even though I've rotated the ventricular mass. If I bring in another specimen that has twisted atrioventricular connections or the so-called crisscross heart. You can see my probe is within the left atrium through the mitral valve and exiting the left ventricle, which is in this case inferior to the right ventricle. If I put my probe in the right atrioventricular junction and across the tricuspid valve, you can see how those atrioventricular junctions are crisscrossed. The heart has been cut in a long axis plane so that if I tilt it a bit to show the septal surface, only my right palm can be placed on the septum with my fingers 
in the outlet and my thumb in the inlet so that this is right hand ventricular topology. So now we've determined how we're going to distinguish between the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, the left ventricle. We have set the scene for sequential segmental analysis. But let's come back to segmental harmony and disharmony because I do need to go in some detail with this reason why potentially we had this, our initial schism. Because as I've already intimated, when Dr. Van Praag first introduced this notion of concordance and discordance, he was accounting for the arrangements of the segments relative to each other. And that subtlety had not become apparent to us, because as I've also said, we thought that he was talking about the way that the components of the segments joined each other across the junctions between them. So let me illustrate to you what I mean by considering what Dr. Van Praag was calling concordance. So for Dr. Van Praag, concordance was situs solitus, S as you see in the brackets, along with D, bulboventricular looping, what we now call right-handed ventricular topology. Discordance was the combination Cytus solitus with left-handed ventricular topology. But what we had not appreciated was that these terms for Dr. Van Praag retained their meaning irrespective of the way the atrial chambers joined the cavities of the ventricles across the atrioventricular junctions. So this is the normal heart. As you see, segmental harmony, Cytus solitus, S, we have a D bulbo ventricular loop, right handed ventricular topology. And in this setting, in the normal heart, of course, the right atrium joins to the right ventricle, the left atrium joins to the left ventricle. But here is another heart that is congenitally malformed. Again, we have situs solitus. We have a D loop ventricular mass, but in this example, both atrial chambers are joining to the dominant left ventricle. The right ventricle is incomplete and right-sided. Now we call that double inlet left ventricle. Dr. Van Praag also calls it double inlet left ventricle. But what we had not appreciated when we thought we were modifying the segmental approach is that for Dr. Van Praag, what you see to your right hand despite the fact that it has double inlet left ventricle, because it is situs solitus, D bulbo ventricular looping, there is segmental harmony. For Dr. Van Praag, this is still atrioventricular concordance. That, however, brings us up with another question. Can we determine ventricular topology when the right ventricle is incomplete? And that question has been posed to me several times over recent weeks. And initially, I questioned that myself, but it's now become evident to me that we can indeed determine ventricular topology if we take the inlet of the incomplete right ventricle as the interventricular communication. And when we take that stance, we can place the palms of our hands on the septal surface of the incomplete right ventricle, putting our thumb through the interventricular communication and letting our fingers go up the outflow tract. And on that basis, as Diane is going to show you, we can still determine ventricular topology in the setting of double inlet left ventricle. This heart is an example of a double inlet left ventricle. And if I lift the anterior half off, I can quickly show you that with the right atrium and the right atrioventricular valve and the left atrium and the left atrioventricular valve connected to this dominant morphologically left ventricle. In anterior superior position, we have a rudimentary and incomplete ventricle that is lacking its inlet. It has an apical trabecular component that if we look inside the ventricle shows us there are coarse trabeculations consistent with a morphologically right ventricle. 
Within the outlet is the aortic valve and the aortic root is supported by a complete muscular infundibulum. The only inlet to this rudimentary and incomplete ventricle is the interventricular communication. So using that interventricular communication as our inlet, this ventricle will only permit the palm of my left hand to lie on the septum with my thumb in the inlet and my fingers in the outlet, exhibiting left hand ventricular topology. So this is an example of segmental disharmony because there is usual atrial arrangement along with left hand ventricular topology. But we must remember that the atrioventricular connection is one of a double inlet. Here we can see the usual atrial arrangement with the right atrium, the morphologically right atrium to the right and the morphologically left atrium to the left. In the system initially used by Dr. Van Prague, this specimen would be designated as having discordance. But the heart does not have discordant atrioventricular connections since the left atrium has retained its connection with the dominant morphologically left ventricle. So that we can confirm that this heart does have a double inlet left ventricle with the morphologically left atrium, maintaining its connection with the morphologically left ventricle. This heart is a close cousin of congenitally corrected transposition in the terms of ventricular topology. Remember we said it had left hand ventricular topology, but it is different with regard to the atrioventricular connections, which we also demonstrated are that of a double inlet left ventricle. So we can, I believe, in most instances, determine ventricular topology even when the left ventricle is dominant, the right ventricle is incomplete. But this produces further paradoxes that are relevant to our ongoing schism, because you also know that in several times over the past few months, we've discussed the fact that there are still some authorities that describe that small chamber in the setting of double inlet left ventricle as an infundibular outlet chamber. Well, that creates a problem in itself, because if it was only an infundibulum, we wouldn't be able to use septal surface of that ventricle to determine ventricular topology. So in fact, it is implicit that that small chamber has to be an incomplete right ventricle. And there is one additional paradox that emerges from recognition that that small chamber is the incomplete right ventricle. Because Dr. Van Braag, now disapproving of our use of the term connections, argues that we can use alignments to mean the same thing as connections. But in fact, that is not the case. And we're going to use the example of classical tricuspid atresia to show you that alignments are not the same thing as connections. Because in classical tricuspid atresia, in which there is usual atrial arrangement, there is right-handed ventricular topology, there is atrioventricular concordance, as described by Dr. Van Prague, the reason we modify our approach to segmental approach because we recognize that in this setting, despite the fact that the cavity of the right atrium was aligned relative to the cavity of the incomplete right ventricle, the two chambers were not connected to each other. And that is one of the reasons why we introduced the notion of atrioventricular connections. And Diane's now going to show you that in a heart that has classical tricuspid atresia. This heart has classic tricuspid valve atresia where there is no potential connection between the right atrium and the right ventricle. It has also been dissected on the short axis where the majority of the atriums have been cut away to show us that classic dimple at the floor of the right atrium. So that the cavity of the right atrium in this case is aligned directly 
with the cavity of the incomplete right ventricle. And this incomplete right ventricle exhibits right hand ventricular topology so that the palm of my right hand can be placed in the septum with my thumb towards the inlet and my fingers in the outlet, in essence demonstrating concordance. So these two chambers are not connected to one another. And the important point to note here is that, is that alignment is not the same as a connection. So how do we get around all of this? And how do we take away, how do we resolve this schism in terms of connections and in terms of the way we use concordance and discordance? Well, the answer is simple. We don't use concordance and discordance anymore because we recognize now that when Dr. Van Prague introduced those terms, he used them to account for segmental harmony and disharmony. So now when we are describing the atrioventricular connections, we say that they are concordant or discordant. We do not use the words as nouns. And that now permits us to distinguish double inlet ventricle from concordant or discordant atrioventric connections, or it also permits us to distinguish what we see in congenitally corrected transposition for the mixed atrioventricular connections we find in the setting of isomeric atrial appendages. Now, why am I emphasizing this fact? Let's look again at isomeric atrial appendages. You'll recognize that I'm showing you here isomeric right atrial appendages. And you know that oftentimes you find isomeric right atrial appendages coexisting with right-handed ventricular topology. But we have a problem because we can have exactly the same isomeric right atrial appendages and they can coexist with left-handed topology when each atrium joins to its own ventricle. And now half of the heart is concordantly connected and the other half is discordantly connected. So in this setting, which we used to call ambiguous atrioventricular connections, we realize there is nothing ambiguous at all. The connections are biventricular, they are mixed, but we take away the ambiguity by describing the presence of isomeric atrial appendages and specifying the ventricular topology. So that means when we're dealing with isomeric atrial appendages, biventricular, atrioventricular connections, we have to describe ventricular topology. But in most instances, that is the only time we need to describe specifically ventricular topology. Because for the rest of the time, we are distinguishing between the atrial and the ventricular chambers, and we are describing how the chambers are joined to each other. But there is one additional instance when we have to describe segmental topology. And that is that very rare situation in which there is segmental disharmony, but despite the segmental disharmony, the atrial chambers retain their connection to their morphologically appropriate ventricles. I've only ever seen two hearts of this type and only one of them was an autopsy example. And this is that heart. So I'm showing you close up of morphologically right ventricle. You see, there is the tricuspid valve. And arising from the morphologically right ventricle, we have the aorta, we have the pulmonary trunk. Now, even though this is a still picture, you can, figuratively speaking, put the palms of your hands on the septal surface of this morphologically right ventricle so that you put your thumb in the inlet, tricuspid valve, and you let your fingers go up the arterial outlets. And I hope everyone is only able to get the palmar surface of their left hand, the septal surface of this morphologically right ventricle. So you can see here we are dealing with left-handed ventricular topology. But where is the tricuspid valve originating from. So I've turned around the heart here and I've put a big probe through the tricuspid valve. And as you see, it's coming up and it's going into the morphologically right 
atrium. The right atrium in this heart is connected to the morphologically left ventricle, which morphologically right ventricle rather, which has left-handed topology. And on the other side of the heart, left atrium is joined to the morphologically left ventricle. There are concordant atrioventricular connections with usual atrial arrangement, despite the segmental disharmony. Now that's no problem to us because we can simply say there are concordant atrioventricular connections and there is left-handed ventricular topology. The problem with Van Pragian nomenclature is that this heart, which has S-L-D-O-R-V, that means the right atrium is connected to the left ventricle and the left atrium is connected to the right ventricle. So you cannot use Van Pragian nomenclature in the regular way to account for segmental disharmony, which is another reason why we have promoted sequential segmental analysis. So on that basis, let's turn full circle and let's come back to congenitally corrected transposition. Because that is the connection of discordant connections about both junctions. It can be found with usual mirror image appendages. We can find left-handed topology with isomeric atrial appendages. We can find left-handed topology with double inlet left ventricle, but they are not congenitally corrected transposition because they do not have discordant atrioventricular connections. So this is congenitally corrected transposition. Morphologically right atrium joins the morphologically left ventricle, which gives rise to the pulmonary trunk. The morphologic left atrium joins the morphologically right ventricle, which gives rise to the aorta. And this is the situation, usual atrial arrangement, but you can have exactly the same thing with mirror imaged atrial arrangement. But now, because of the discordant atrioventricular connections, the left ventricle is where you expect it to be, but it still gives rise to the coronary trunk. The mirror imaged left atrium gives rise to a right-sided morphologically right ventricle, and that gives rise to the aorta we have congenitally corrected transposition with mirror imaged atrial arrangement. And the key here is that when we find this variant of congenitally corrected transposition, almost always the aorta is right-sided. It is transposition IDD, it is D transposition, but it is congenitally corrected and it is D loop. This heart has congenitally corrected transposition. The aorta lies to the left of the pulmonary trunk, and it has been cut just prior to the bifurcation of the brachiocephalic arteries. We see the superior and inferior cable veins joining a morphologically right atrium. So here is the blunt triangular tip to the appendage and the broad attachment with the venous component. Looking inside, of the right atrium, we see the characteristic pectinate muscles around the right atrioventricular junction. Here's the coronary sinus and the flap valve at the floor of the oval fossa. The oval foramen is probe patent in this case. Guarding the inlet, we have a morphologically mitral valve, which will always travel with the left ventricle. It's supported by paired papillary muscles and there are no attachments to the septal surface. The morphologically right atrium is connected to a morphologically left ventricle so that we have discordant atrioventricular connections. There are the fine crisscrossing apical trabeculations that are the morphologic determinant of the left ventricle. We can see that smooth septal surface towards the outlet component of the ventricle. And here, there is fibrous continuity between the mitral valve and the pulmonary valve. This is the pulmonary trunk exiting the left ventricle and dividing or bifurcating into the right and left pulmonary arteries. So that now we have a discordant atrioventricular and ventriculoarterial connection.
but the flow of blood is still going the right way around. Looking at the left side of the heart, we see the pulmonary veins draining into this left-sided atrium, which we can confirm is a morphologically left atrium with its tubular appendage and the narrow attachment to the venous component of the atrium. When we look inside, the atrial vestibule is smooth. Here is the left side of the flap valve, which you can see is propatent, and the pectinate muscles are confined to the appendage. So this is a morphologically left atrium. The inlet is guarded by a morphologically tricuspid valve that has one of the associated malformations seen with congenitally corrected transposition, namely an Epstein's malformation. There's also a bit of dysplasia to this valve. It is a morphologically tricuspid valve because there are attachments to the septal surface and attachments to papillary muscles. The tricuspid valve will always travel with a right ventricle so that on the left we do have a morphologically right ventricle with its coarse apical trabeculations. So here we have discordant atrioventricular connections on the left side as well. Within the outlet, the aorta is supported by a complete muscular infundibulum. So again, discordant atrioventricular and discordant ventriculoarterial connections. This ventricle does exhibit left-hand ventricular topology as I can only place the palm of my left hand on the septum with my thumb in the inlet and my fingers in the outlet. The interventricular septum is intact in this case with congenitally corrected transposition. So, we've put everything together, we've discussed sequential segmental analysis, we've shown you the evolution of the way that we now describe the congenitally malformed heart, and we've brought you back to congenitally corrected transposition. And I hope we've shown you that if we are successfully to diagnose and distinguish this lesion first, we have to determine the morphology of the segments, and then we have to work out how they are joined together. I hope we've emphasized that you should not now be using one feature to infer another, that is the essence, morphologically method, morphological method, but above all, it is the way that the chambers are joined together that is the key to the circulatory pathways, and that tells you which way the blood goes round. So this is our introduction. Next week, we're going to take this information, we're going to take you deeper into congenitally corrected transposition, and we're going to discuss with you the variations that you can find even in those hearts that are unified because they have discordant atrioventricular connections combined with discordant ventriculoarterial connections. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anderson. It was a very, very good talk. Let me just uh, stop the sharing here. Okay, very good. So as usual, uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Norman Silverman to start with his comments. This was a very, very nice illustrative talk. This is uh, one of the sessions that we should uh, keep forever and review it uh, frequently. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Uh, Dr. Silverman. Well, um, I, I enjoyed that a great deal. I must uh, just say that I'm sitting and following uh, Bob's talk here with the Ezon Goldberg handbook, which is uh, my Bible and sits on my desk every day so that I can refer to this. And uh, for those of you that have not bought it, it is certainly a sobering and uh, illuminating uh, correction of uh, your understanding of, of morphology. I, I have no real problems with um, uh, this being an Andersonian by philosophy myself. I've never really understood alignments. 
I, I, I really find that a difficult concept, but it's obviously not a problem. The problem in the world today is a different problem, I think, in the world of pediatric cardiology. It's the problem between convention and reason. And I think that's the essence of the issue here. Because um, what Professor Anderson has given us today, which is, um, um, I think, very clear, is a reasoned approach to how you look at these uh, anomalies. And that, to me, is the essence of this talk uh, uh, for today. And I, I really have nothing else to say, uh, except that I'm going to uh, put alignments away out of my mind and continue to consider the connections of the chambers one to the other in a sequential, segmental fashion. Thank you, Norman. Thank you very much. Uh, on the surgical uh, perspective, and uh, do you like to, to comment uh, that, the surgeons uh, who are here today? So I, I don't know, I, I can't see who is here. Sasha, I don't, don't know if he's here. So if in the surgical perspective, what's the difference that uh, it makes? I think we've got uh, Dr. Quintessenza with Diane, who I'm sure can make a few comments. And Sasha is- Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Very good, very yeah. good. Uh, <laughs> both I, surgeons I, are I, here. <laughs> I prefer that it start uh, Professor Quintessence. Uh, oh, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> so I would just, you know, I would agree. I don't really have much to add to this. I mean, I think it's just been just beautifully demonstrated and connections seem to work. Uh, I think that's what I would say. And when we're kind of thinking about I mean, how to approach things, how to think about things, how to reconstruct things, the connections are really, you know, what, what, what I think about where the blood's gonna flow. And, and so it's always been very, uh, compatible with kind of uh, understanding of the process. Uh, I thought it was a great demonstration. Okay, no, the only thing that I want to add that, uh, you know, Bob and Diane make it uh, so easy to, to, to understand, but it is not so easy in uh, echo <laughs> and CT scan. And the only things that I experience in my small experience that this patient is better to treat uh, never as a neonate, never in the first uh, uh, months of life and wait uh, for, uh, in, in our experience is uh, 10 kilogram, eight to 10 kilograms is the best time to decide to connect or to uh, try to do a double switch or whatever is the indication. I don't know what is the idea of Professor Quintessence or the experience. In terms of doing the double switch procedure, Usually, I think six six to nine months is typical. Uh, we may not get quite the 10 kilos there, uh, but that's, that seems reasonable for us as well. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, is, uh, is Adrian with us today, Grace? I yes, am. Him. Yes. Ah, Adrian, Hello. you have had, uh, you've been pressing me all the time to make things simpler to understand and to answer all your questions. And I promised you we were going to do our very best today. Are you satisfied with what you have heard? I, I think we are almost there, Professor Anderson. And <laughs> for all the clinicians who are working every day with the morphologist, we all know that it's not always easy to follow the nomenclature for various reasons, but that doesn't mean that we should not always strive to do. And I just wanted to make a few comments because it's the right time now. Uh, first of all, the pectinate muscles, they are always in the appendage. They never escape the appendage of some people would think. So they don't go into the vestibule and we can discuss where the vestibule is coming, on, um, is coming from uh, embryologically then we have to mention about connections and junctions and the various types of connections and when we use absent connection, when we use atresia and what do they cover? Because some people would, would use them interchangeably and that's not the right thing to do. And then we have to accept that with the specimens in our hands, we can position the small ventricular chamber either to the right or to the left is not always easy. It is always a right ventricle anterior superior, but to say precisely that is right or left is not extremely um, easy, but that 
still allows us to uh, find the topology if we follow the rule with the palm on the septum. So we should not be very fast about deciding the right or left just by the position of the small chamber. We should do the topology. And I think this is, this is what I meant. And I wanted to ask you whether you've ever seen undecided looping, whether it's not clearly right or left, but remains in a neutral position. Thank you very much. This was very useful and we should take all the questions. There is a one good question in the, in the chat I've seen. Now you ask a very good question as to whether there is ever undetermined looping. And I think the one situation where that might come in is where you have a dominant uh, left ventricle and the incomplete right ventricle is positioned directly anterior. And I've seen that on one occasion and then if the small right ventricle is directly anterior, the aorta is coming out of it and shooting straight upwards, then arguably you could get the palm of each hand on that surface. But that's the only situation I think now where I would uh, contemplate. And even then, I think that there is indeed a good question. One of the questions asked was in double inlet left ventricle do we always have two mitral valves? And that depends on how you look at the valves. Both of the valves are trying to be mitral valves because they are septophobic. But if you look at them very subtly, there are differences between the valves and the one valve tends to resemble a tricuspid valve a little bit more, but it can be difficult to distinguish them. And that's why in the setting of double inlet left ventricle, I would call them the right valve and the left valve. I would rather avoid that potential stumbling block. I think if you call them the right valve, the left valve, you then have no problems in distinguishing between them. And to all intents and purposes, I think you can always distinguish topology. Alan, you're on the screen, you have something to add. Well, not really much to add. I've always followed your um, system. And I think the important thing we were always taught was that you should be able to express in words to somebody on the other side of the world what the heart looks like and be consistent. You don't need to actually see a diagram if you can express in words exactly what the heart looks like to somebody else. Is what, that's the aim of the exercise. We're always taught that. And I think that this system allows you to do that, allows you to, to express exactly what's happening in words. Indeed, I, I think you've, you've uh, stated the situation very nicely there. That's absolutely the point. The words have to mean what you want them to mean, and that's what we try to emphasize during today's talk. And that's a very good point that you have made. Bob, I, I wonder whether you could uh, comment on, on Adrian's uh, remark about the fact that the pectinate muscles do not come out of the appendage because I've always understood that the morphology of the right ventricle of the right atrium is that the pectinate muscles do come out of the appendage and no, surround no, no, the no, vestibule. No, that, that's the not valve. the case. It, uh, the pectinate muscles define the appendage. On the right side, the appendage extends all the way around. That's the point that Diane was making. She showed you the pectinate muscles go all the way around and they reach the subthabesian sinus, that is still the appendage because it is pectinated. It is on the left side where there are potential problems. They can sneak out a little bit on the septal surface, but the point that Diane was making is that they never encroach beyond the vestibule. So always the pulmonary venous component, which is smooth, is confluent with the vestibule at the, in, the inferior margin the pectinate muscles are within the appendage. Okay, that's a good point. It clears it up. So the appendage <laughs> is bigger than you think. Indeed, absolutely. <laughs> and that's the other point that Diane made. She showed you when she showed that heart. And many, many adult cardiologists think this. They show you the little tip of, the, of what is the appendage. And they say, this is the appendage. In fact, the entire anterior wall of the right atrium is made up of the appendage. It is pectinated. And those pectinate muscles continue along the diaphragmatic surface and they reach to the subthabesian sinus. That's and an that's important point. It's good that you clarify that point. Well, I'd like to that is very well 
Adrian is coming in. That is very well said at page four in this book. I strongly recommend it because it explains exactly where the pectinate muscles goes between the vestibule and the sinus, uh, the venous sinus. What page is that, Adrian? Page four. <laughs> <laughs> another, another, Norman has, a, has a, I think that the Ezon Goldberg Atlas is still available. It's only $40 and you can get it yes. through Amazon. Correct. It's very good value, much better value than pediatric cardiology, which Norman <laughs> has on the shelf behind, which I think is $300. <laughs> well, mine is excellent value, see, because I, uh, I well, I, I, it's, it's certainly good value, but I'm not going to debate the merits of the two. Well, I, I just wanted to make a point of, of clarification. So the topology, right or left hand, it always goes with the right ventricle irrespective of if there's VA discordance or concordance, correct? This, this is correct. And that is purely by convention. You, if you have right-handed topology where you put your right hand on the septal surface of the right ventricle, of course, you can put your left hand on the septal surface of the left ventricle. But by convention, it is the right ventricle we use to determine the topology. And in fact, if you put your hands together, and you wrap your thumb over the top, like I'm doing at the moment, you're, you're seeing the back of it. If I turn it round and I show you that, that is the normal heart. And then you can do what Diane did, because however you rotate your hands, you never change the topical, topological arrangement. And this is a very useful exercise for understanding the essence of ventricular topology. And just one more point regarding the topology, you know, when we, when we worry about conduction system locations, is it safe to say whenever we have right-handed topology, we have a posterior type of conduction system and a left-handed topology, more of an anterior, especially in double and left ventricle? Well, we're going to come to that next week when we get into discussing congenitally corrected transposition. I should stress for everybody that today was the introduction to what we're going to do next week because perhaps more important is segmental alignment. So topology is important, but if you have right-handed topology with mirror image derangement, you can, in the setting of, seg of septal malalignment, still get an anterior node. So we will be discussing that next week in the setting of congenitally corrected transposition, in the setting of double inlet ventricle, it makes no difference whether the small ventricle is on the right or the left, you always have an, an abnormal anterior node. So that is something we will be discussing next week. This is going to be very interesting. I just want to ask if Dr. Bollander has something to add before we go to the questions. David, it's good to see you with us again this week. Where's he gone? Uh, he's there. He just needs to unmute himself. I got to unmute there. Thank you. Hey, how are you? Good um, to see you. Good. Thanks. Nice to see all of you. Um, I think we need to start from the beginning because remember, with respect to, uh, or in contrast to all of you, I work at the other end of med of the medical spectrum, at the, for the M ones and M twos, etc. In undergraduate medical education, and we need to have a better start there with all of this. I think you know, including or trying to bring in ideas of this, um, Bob's idea of the sequential segmental morphology analysis at that time and helping the students to understand that this is going to be something that's gonna be useful to them. And particularly for somebody who, like me, who also teaches the heart development, it's nice to have the students have the basics of this type of, um, morphology so that they can then understand why a ventricle or an atria has so many different precursors coming together. It's not just an expansion of that simple primitive chamber, but it's, it, it's the bringing several things together, several precursors together and creating this definitive atrium or this definitive ventricle. So we need to start from, better from the beginning and Hopefully we can in, 
entice some of our and uh, many of our anatomy colleagues next week when Diane and Dr. Mori and I um, try to instruct them on this in a symposium that we're having in the annual meeting next week. I mean, it's great, good, great news that you're doing this, David, because I agree 100% with what you're saying. We have to start at the beginning, and the beginning is the anatomy, demonstrate the anatomy labs that every medical student goes through. And I think that we have the system now that we can start from the beginning. I mean, you have been with me on now on numerous years whilst I've been in Wisconsin, and you know how we've put things together and how we've built on it. And it's great that you're taking this up and you're sharing it with the uh, anatomical community, because I agree with you 100%. We have to start at the beginning. And it's not difficult these days to understand. We need to do it with our nurses. We need to do it with all the people who are associated with medicine, because it isn't rocket science anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we can start with no. some questions. We still have... Uh time for that. So we have one first question that it's a uh, in double inlet left ventricle. Are there two mitral valves? I've already touched on that. They are, I think they are better off considered right and left. Mm -hmm. I think that if you look at them very carefully, you can just dis make, dis make distinctions between them, but it is very subtle. So I, I think easier to call them right and left. They, because in double inlet left ventricle, neither of the valve really is associated with the septum. They are septophobic valves. Dr. Van Prague calls the mitral valve the septophobic valve, the tricuspid valve the septophilic valve. In the essence of double outlet right ventricle is that the septum doesn't come between the AV valves. They clap together. That is what you see as echocardiographers. That's the feature of double inlet ventricle. But if you look at them very carefully, there are subtle differences between them, but much easier to distinguish them as being right and left. Okay, perfect. So Joseph is asking, when the only inlet into a rudimentary chamber is the ventricular communication, how can topology be defined using handlessness uh, when the palm can no longer face the ventricular septum? Interesting. Well, I think it can face the ventricular septum because as Diane showed you with her lovely example, when she was showing you the double inlet left ventricle, she put her finger through the interventricular communication. And then by placing your finger, figuratively speaking, through the interventricular communication, the palm of your hand automatically goes on the septum. And then your hands, when you put them up into the outflow tract, Either the right hand will go on or the left hand will go on. So it, it, it is a figurative, it's an exercise. You have to think of what you're doing. But Diane showed that it does work when you have the heart in your hand. It's harder when you're imagining it. But if you give it a bit of time and you contemplate on it, you'll find it does work. And if I may suggest, if people can do a CT in these patients, it helps very much in reconstruction. It can show you exactly where you put your hand. That's a very good point that Adrian makes. I think that CTs these days are transforming our understanding of the congenitally malformed heart. To me, the computed tomographic images that we now get is the testing ground for our morphologic concepts. We have one more question from Dr. Paul Zelinsky, who is always with us. Thank you for that. He say, just semantically, in the absence of isometric atrial arrangements, ventricular uh, topology might not need to be spe specifically stated. If we state the atrioventricular and ventricular arterial connection, would that be true? This is, I also touched upon that, and that is true for concordant and discordant atrioventricular connections. It is not true, however, for mixed atrioventricular connections, because if you have isomeric atrial appendages, then if you have right-handed or left ventricular topology, still half of the heart will be concordantly connected, half of the heart will be discordantly connected. You don't specifically need to specify topology with the univentricular atrioventricular connections. 
There it's more important to discuss the relationship between the incomplete right ventricle and the incomplete ventricle and the dominant ventricle. Okay, very clear. So Dario is saying, should we distinguish RV from LV only by position, always anterior, the morphology, uh, morphologically right, and always posterior, the left? I think that is a working rule, but if you take a heart that has double inlet left ventricle, in which in terms of development, the incomplete right ventricle is going to be on the shoulders of that ventricular mass, you can then turn that heart and even though it's still the shoulder, the shoulder can be turned into posterior position. So it is the trabeculations that are the final determinant. And you okay. have to think of that in terms, when you put the two ventricles together, is that incomplete ventricle on the shoulder of the ventricular mass, or is it in the hip pocket of the ventricular mass? And you have to take rotation into account when you're working that all out, but it is the apical components relative to each other that are the final arbiters. Okay, perfect. And we have one last question from Mateo Rios. Uh, is there a pattern for the position of the atrium's appendages on the surface of the heart? Normal position side by side and so. And how this correlates to inner anatomy and connections? I think the Atrial appendages, the pectinate muscles determine the appendages. I don't think, I, the heart doesn't rotate quite so much at atrial level as it does at ventricular level. So that's unlikely to be a problem for the atrial chambers. The, the potential problem with the atrial chambers is juxtaposition of the atrial appendages. And there you can still recognize the appendage morphology even when they are juxtaposed. So you can have left isomerism, with juxtaposed left atrial appendages. I've never seen juxtaposed right atrial appendages. I guess somebody tomorrow is going to say they have a case, but in that case, I, I would... <laughs> Who said Do that? You? <laughs> Silverman. <laughs> Norman, you have a case with juxtaposed right atrial appendages? On the left side. With pectinate muscles coming to the crooks? Yeah. Well... You, I, have you published that? No, I haven't, Bob. <laughs> well, you need to publish that because it is important that despite the presence of juxtaposition, you were still able to recognize that there are isomeric right appendages. Which I hope you're going to put that into the, the app when it becomes available. I'll try. Amazing. It was a very, very good discussion, guys. Thank you very much again. For, for being with us, amazing panelists. And uh, I'm sure the discussion was very rich and very important for the basis of what we are doing. Thank you, thank you very much. Before See you, you next go, week. Grace, let, let me just say that we are, yes. as we've been discussing, next week, we are going to be embroidering what we have discussed this week, because we're going to show how, on the basis of what we've discussed today, you can, discuss, you can understand the variations you see in the setting of congenitally corrected transposition, and we're going to be developing the themes. So we hope that everybody who's been with us today will be with us also next week. For sure. And guys, please send the link of this talk on YouTube to your colleagues. I'm sure this is going to be very important. People will learn a lot for the sonographers. Uh, our sonographers here at CIDR, they always watch and they are always very happy with the knowledge that they are getting. So I suggest you to forward this talk to all of your multidisciplinary team. Bye bye, guys. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. bye.